Hello everyone. A very good morning to all. I, Rachana Krasta, Assistant Professor in the Department of Mathematics, welcome you all for the first webinar organized by the Department of Physical Education, St. Joseph Engineering College on basic concepts of chess. To enhance our knowledge in chess, we have among us a international master, Ms. Ivana Maria Futado. Ms. Ivana, 21 year old chess prodigy from Goa, currently pursuing her Bachelor of Engineering from our college, St. Joseph Engineering College in Civil Engineering. Ms. Ivana, at five years and three months, played her first tournament at Moira under seven category championship where she won her first prize. After that, she never turned back. From then, she has participated in number of international and national level chess championship and won several age events. Some of her international achievements are gold medal in the Asian School Chess Festival in under seven and under eight age category held at Singapore and Sri Lanka respectively, gold medal in the Asian Youth Chess Championship under eight, 10, 12 age categories, won both the individual and team gold medal in the under eight World School Championship, won gold medal in the World Youth Championship under 8 and 10 category. In 2007, she successfully defended her world title in becoming the third Indian girl to win more than one world age group title. In 2008, she won her third consecutive Goan State under 9 chess championship. Won Commonwealth Games thrice in under 12, 14, 18 categories in 2009, 11, and 15, respectively. She was the champion of Asian Junior Championship in the year 2012 and 2017. Ivana was entered into the Limca Book of World Records in 2007 for being the youngest Indian to win a world title in any sports aged seven years to 26 days. She was voted the sports woman for the year 2007 by the Goa Sports Journalist Association for the Gino Award. She was the person of the year by Goa Today in 2007. At present, she has 40 plus gold, silver and bronze medals in an international level and 10 plus in national level in her credit. Her FIDE ranking, that is International Chess Federation ranking is 2139. The biggest titles that she has earned are Women International Master in 2012, Women FIDE Master 2011, Women Candidate Master 2008. Dear Ivana, we are proud of you and wish you achieve more accolades to your credits in your future endeavors. On behalf of the entire SJC family, I extend a hearty welcome to you, Ivana. I extend a hearty and warm welcome to all the attendees for this webinar. A warm welcome to one and all. Participants, Kindly note, your mics are muted by default. So for any queries or questions, please make use of chat box option. At the end of the session, a feedback link will be shared in the chat box. Feel free to give your opinion about the webinar. An e-certificate will be sent to you within three days on submission of the feedback form. Thank you. Now I request Ms. Ivana Futado to take over the session. Over to you, Ivana. Good morning, everyone. And uh, first, 
I would like to thank all of you for uh, joining in today, despite the global pandemic that all of us are facing, and making time for coming to the session to learn chess. And I would also like to thank the SJEC management for and the sports uh, sports department for um, conducting this event. Supporting um, anybody who is interested, not only in sports, but in any um, activities that we want to do or take part, we always get the support. Okay. And okay, without a more further ado, let's start the session. And I'm going to be doing for today's uh, session, I'm going to start with um, the basics in chess. I'll just give you all an introduction of chess, first of all. Uh, chess is it was initiated in india and it was called satranj and um from india it um persia and you know the arabic countries and then it went to so if you have to say from where chess started it was in it's an indian sport which was created and now it has been developed in other countries as well to a very great extent. Okay, so we're gonna start with just basic movement of pieces. Okay? See, if we have our fundamental uh, uh, principles in, in chess very thorough, we can easily, you know, chess is a very easy game. Everybody thinks it's very complicated and you have to learn different things, but it's not that way. You just have to, what the simple things, you have to understand it, you know, thoroughly and then once you have understood these basic knowledges how the pieces moves you know you have the basic concepts clear then you can you start playing games even if you lose you learn from your mistakes and that's how it goes okay so let's just start with chessboard with two kings on it okay so in chess the this is the battlefield this is the place where the war goes on okay it's 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 the place if we want to learn the game you have to learn the chess board first properly so the only difference between a war on a chess board is that in this war there is no nobody dies there is no bloodshed there is but in a real war people die but it's just like a war between two kingdoms <laughs> as you can see there are uh, there is a white team and a black team these are the two teams playing two kingdoms and you have all the pieces which are starting from the king, the queen, and then you have elephant, which is also called the rook. Then you have knight, which is called the horse also, bishop, and the soldiers. All right, so let's just start with the chessboard. And firstly, I want you all to understand how to name these squares. Now, for example, I'm just going to highlight some squares and I'll show the naming of these coordinates. Like you just have to take now, as you can see, as you move towards the X axis, okay, horizontally, you have alphabets starting from alphabet A, you can see this B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. So we have alphabets from to H and as we go vertically upwards we have numbers starting from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. Okay so for example if I, I have highlighted one red square over here now this, there are 64 squares in this entire chessboard there are 64 squares okay and each square in particular has a name how we have our own names, how we are identified by our name. Like my name is Ivana Like everybody has their own name, right? So these squares, each square has its own name or each, each of these 64 squares have their own name. Now, for example, this square, you, you go down and you take the alphabet, which is there over here. That is B, alphabet B and the number two. So this square's name would be called B2. 
this square name is B. Now, for example, this square, the one over here, you go right down, you take what that is D, and the number which you see here is five. So this square's name is D5. Okay, then here, this one would be F, and the alpha the number would be F3. So as we go on, any square, not just not just this square, I mean every square would have a name. Now, for example, this one down over here, and you see B, and you take the number which is vertically over here, that is seven. So we take numbers as vertically and alphabets horizontally. So it is just as we have um, in, you know, each square. Now, for example, let me just take the square where the king is on. Here, this is called H1. The king is placed on H1. This is the address of the king, where it is situated right now. Like how we have our home addresses, the king right now is situated on the square H1. Okay, so now since we have got a brief introduction on the chessboard, um, we can start with the movement of the pieces. And as you can see, the chessboard, when we have pieces arranged, we start with the rook, then we go to the knight, and then you have the bishop, queen, king, bishop, knight, and rook. Okay, so these names, I mean, rook is the technical word for it, but we generally, in common terms, we can know it as the elephant. The rook is also called an elephant. Okay, like I said, in ancient times, chess was played by kingdoms and by the kings. They used to, that time, they were called as elephants. But now, oh, it is, the, the names have been changed and it's been given a more, you know, a different way. So here, this a common way we would call it as an elephant, a horse, because this is the only piece that can jump in a chessboard. This is the piece which can jump. So as you know, did horses jump? So we call this also a horse, and this would be the camel. The bishop is also called the camel. And then we have the queen, which is the strongest piece of the chessboard. And then the king, which is not the strongest piece, but it is the most important piece. So our most important piece that we have, and then the bishop again, we have two pairs of, we have a pair of bishops. One is on the dark square and one is on the light square. So this bishop, I will be uh, telling you how the pieces move. So this bishop is the light square bishop and this is the dark square bishop. Then we have another knight over here and then the rook and eight pawns, the eight soldiers, which are, Okay, so let's start with the piece which is at the edge, that is the rook. Okay, just place it here. So this rook, it can move straight up, straight down, straight right, and straight left. So this rook, it can, anything that comes in its way, it can capture it. For example, let's just say this rook, it it moves in a in a plus shape, right? It can go up, down, as many steps as he wants. He doesn't have to go only one step. You can take one, two, three, four steps as well. It is up to you. Wherever you want to place it, you can place it there. So the rook, it goes in this direction, straight up, down, right, and left. Okay, so if I place something in the way of the rook, it, I'm just placing... See, we can capture only our opponent's pieces. We cannot capture our own pieces. Like, for example, in a war that's going on, two armies, we will go and cap we'll go to attack our opponent, right? Not the own, our own men, we don't do that. So here in chess, also, we capture our opponent's pieces. We can, if suppose there is a pawn here, my rook cannot go and capture my own piece. That is, this is against the uh, rules of chess. We cannot go and capture our own pieces. You can go and capture your opponent's pieces. So let me take it out. And here, this rook can go straight up, down, right, and left. So the rook can capture only the pieces which are in the way of it. It cannot go and cap, which is on F6. You can see, right, this pawn is placed on F6. So the rook cannot go there and capture this pawn. It can go to H5. 
H5. So the square is H5. So it can go to H5. It can go to D. Right? It can go to B5 and it can go to D2. Okay? It cannot go to F3 again. So whatever is placed in the way of the rook, you can go and capture it. You cannot go and capture the king or the uh, the other king. You can't do that. Only what comes in the way of it, only that piece we can capture or we can attack. Capture means kill it. In simple terms, it just means kill. So here the rook can capture these pieces, these, these soldiers. And suppose now let's just go with, now we have actually, after the rook, we have the knight, but I'm going to keep the knight for last because it is a little bit tricky since it's the only piece that can jump. We're going to see how the knight moves a little bit later. Let's take the bishop now. So we have, as you can see, we have two bishops, right? We have the c1 bishop, the bishop on c1 and the bishop on f1. One is on the dark square and the other one is on the light square. Similarly, for our opponent also, they have two bishops. Okay, and one is on the light square and one is on the dark square. So let's just see the one of the bishops, that is the light square bishop first. Now we take the dark square, we're starting with the dark square bishop. And this bishop, since it is called a dark square bishop and it is digital at the start of the game, it's placed on the dark square. We can say that this bishop only moves on the dark squares. So it can only move diagonally on the dark squares. It cannot move straight like a rook. It can move diagonally. We call it diagonally, or you can also call it slanting in a, in a different way. Okay, so it can go diagonally on the dark squares only. It can never go on the light squares. That's why we have two. The one which can go on the dark squares will only go on the dark squares, and the other bishop will only go on the light squares. So these bishops, so anything placed in the way of the bishop, for example, over here, the same how I told about the rook, the bishop cannot go straight, right? So it can diagonal, whatever comes in the way of it diagonally can be captured. So whatever, all, all the pieces, I'm just taking, for example, be a rook over here or a queen. So anything coming in the way of the bishop diagonally, we can go and capture it. Okay. Then we, let's take the other bishop that we have. That is the light square bishop. So same way how we had the dark square bishop, the light square bishop can only go light squares and it can never go on the dark squares. So anything coming in the way of the light square bishop can be captured. Now, I'm not just going to put pawns. I can put a knight or a rook. Anything that comes in the way of the bishop in the light squares, that is diagonally to it. I mean, you can't say that something on this light square, if the pawn was here on the, this light square, we can't go and capture it just because it's on the light square. It has to be diagonal like this. Okay, so it can capture the knight, the rook. It can go and take the rook. It can capture the soldier on b7, the rook on f7 one on f3 and the knight on b3 okay if anyone has any questions on the bishops the movement of the bishops or the rooks you can put it in the chat okay if you have any doubts you can you feel free to uh, send your question also okay so this is how the bishop moves and now rook we have done with you are done with the rook the bishop now we're gonna go with the queen. So like I mentioned, the queen is the strongest piece that we have. And it it is not only strong that it attacks our opponent's king, it also, we also use the queen to protect our own king. Okay, so the queen, the reason why it is a strongest piece, it is a very simple logic. It is having the movement of a rook. It is, it is a combination of two pieces. It is a combination of a rook as well as a bishop. So it can move like a rook that is straight up, straight down, straight right and left. And it can also move like a bishop diagonally. So if placed on a light square, it can move diagonally on the light squares. Okay. 
and it can also move like a now if was placed say on a dark square it can move it can move straight up straight right left like a rope and it can move diagonally like a dark square bishop because it's placed right now on a dark square so it just matters which square the queen is placed on and on that particular um, color it can go diagonally okay so if the queen can move like a rook plus a bishop that is the reason why it is being given you know a very high um, weightage of points and it's the strongest piece that we have okay uh, now we have the king okay so if you compare the king with the queen let's just do a small comparison no let's first take how the king moves and then we'll compare it with the queen so the king it can go straight up straight down straight right left and diagonal so you you might have a question why is it not as strong as the queen it can also go in all directions it can go like a rook and it can go like a bishop as well but the only problem with the king is it can only take one step at a time it cannot take more steps for example the queen that we have the queen can take can take more than one as many steps as she wants okay as many steps as she wants can go but the king on the other hand can only one step at a time that is the difference between a king and a queen the king can only take one step at a time but the queen she can go as many steps as that is the reason and in all the directions and but the king cannot go as many steps as he wants that is the reason we do not call the king as a strong piece but that said it's that if our king is gone If we lose our king we lose the game it's game over but if we lose our queen we can still play on so the most important piece it might not be the strongest piece that we have but it's the most important piece that we have so we should make sure that sometimes even if you have to give our queen to save the king we have to do that it's like a sacrifice but you have to do it because your king is the most important piece in a chess all right now going forward we have the the rook the knight the bishop the queen and the king i know we haven't done the horse yet right so now we're going to go with the knight okay and like i said the knight the most tricky piece that we have it can it can jump horses can jump so that is the only trick that we need to know right now here is when it comes to a knight or a horse you have to remember two things one is l shape l shape any l shapes right side l shape left side l shape and p steps okay so let's just start with the movement how this knight can go it can go in l right so this is a shape of an l and from the original point it can take one to three then the other l would be this would be one square where it can go and this is another l so 1 2 3 so l shape three steps or then it can go it can go like a l in the right side direction and it can go in the l of the left side direction as well so 1 2 3 3 so this would be the square where the knight can go also and similarly going downwards the cell l shape three steps 1 2 3 and then 1 2 3 4 so all the types of l so the knight can jump to eight squares from its original point on 1 2 3 4 here similarly here and here so this is the knight and it can take three steps l shape anywhere l shape so even if same it something it is not going in a straight direction or in a diagonal direction from its one point it is jumping no other piece can jump like Okay, so this is the knight, and it's very easy. When we are playing in the game, we miss out a lot of moves because of the knight. Because suddenly, from nowhere, it jumps and it reaches a square, and and that is, you know, uh, uh, most of the times, most many players miss out on that. Okay, and now, okay, so this is how the knight moves. Okay. 
and let's just go with the soldiers so the soldiers they go two steps okay they come two steps and after that they can only take one step at a time okay they can just go one step at a time and so they march forward what all the soldiers that we have they march forward straight okay they march straight as, as you know soldiers also march straight right but if anything comes in the way diagonal can capture them but we cannot capture straight we can capture only diagonal okay so this is whatever comes in the way diagonally of any sort you can capture it but you cannot capture it straight this is a simple thing the soldiers are very simple now uh okay i have a question can a knight jump the piece and i also have one more question which says that can you teach few of the most popular opening i won't be teaching you the openings like the popular openings because that's going to take a lot of time so what i'm going to do is i will be just giving you a brief introduction of chess openings and what are the guidelines that you can do in any chess opening all right now uh, also one more question is there that can a knight so elson asked me about the openings it's a good question because uh, chess is very big okay to learn any opening will take you at least say 5 days or something so we can't go with that but i will give you guidelines on how we can play a good opening and i have another question from um uh, and he said that uh, can his question is can a knight jump over a piece yes a knight can jump over a piece let me just hear of these arrows okay so a knight like i said a knight is the only piece that can jump so for example here at the start of the game also we can jump with a knight we can start with a knight because we can jump over our pieces right but if you see the bishop it cannot jump over the piece because it's blocked right now so the bishop cannot go and jump a queen is also blocked by her own piece so the queen cannot cross right or the rook cannot cross but the knight is the only piece which can jump yeah you can you can jump over its pieces you can the knight can jump but other pieces cannot we the bishop cannot jump the queen cannot jump that's why i said i mentioned before the knight is a tricky piece and it is the only piece which can jump and even the soldiers at the first when they are at the initial point they can jump it is like it gives them a boost when they you know at the start they can jump but after that they have to slow down and they can go only one step at a time they cannot jump again so only at the first move we can jump with your soldiers but after that you cannot jump with them again all right so this is um the brief introduction on how our moves now going forward let me explain to you all there are three parts in a chess game okay so you can start with there is an opening middle game and end game so there's like an opening then there is a middle and then there is a closing that's how we can so it's like uh, if you have any games you have level 1 if you cross level 1 with level 2 if you cross level 2 you go to level 3 right so similarly in chess if you cross the opening stage you go to the middle game if you cross the middle game you go to the end game but if you do not play a good opening if you don't have a good start you're going to get into trouble and you might just lose in the opening or you might get a very bad position and you won't won't be able to play a good middle game because your position is already low so you should make sure that your opening might not be the best opening but it is at least decent enough to reach the middle game okay so i am not going to teach you there are hundreds of chess openings we and to do one opening also will take you around 5 to 10 days i It, you cannot just teach an opening that way i am going to teach you how to get a decent position playing the general opening guidelines how most of the openings are based on certain guidelines okay so let's just start with uh, some opening guidelines and the reason why i have given them actually they are called opening rules but i have given them guidelines because they cannot be a rule it's not a rule that if you don't do it you're not going to lose the game but if you don't do it you might have a bad position so they are more like guidelines if you want to follow it if you want to get a good position then you can do it 
but if you just want to play then you can try something else your own creative ideas that is also good but at the start to start a creative would be risky again okay so let's just start with the first guideline that we have develop the minor pieces okay so before uh, no what are minor pieces there are some values of the piece okay for example the pawns that we have the soldiers are just valued one point each they are the smallest uh, pieces and their value is very small so we call it a minor piece. minor means small right we know that minor means small major means something big so the pawns are worth one point each okay then we have the knight which is worth three points same as the bishop so our knight and our bishop is worth three points each they have the same values okay and the pawns are worth one bishop is worth three knight is worth three this is the worth of each piece the value of each piece then we have rook which is categorized in under a major piece because its value you can see it is higher than the pawns and the bishop so these are three are the minor pieces that we have and the rook which is what is a major piece and it's worth five points and the queen is worth nine points the rook that we have is worth five and the queen that we have is worth nine so queen is given the highest weightage since i like i already mentioned the queen can go like a rook and a bishop so that's the reason the queen is given the highest weightage the rook is a, the second strongest piece after the queen then we have the knight and the bishop which is worth three each and the pawn is worth one and the, there is generally we don't put there's no number there's no valued number that we give and if we always have this you know misconception that the king is worth zero okay i know that the king is not the strongest piece but we can never give the king the worth as zero because the king is the most valuable piece so you can give it as much as points as you want because it is the most valued piece if we lose our king we lose the game right so no number can give the value for the king you can give it infinite or any any num biggest number that you want because our king is the most important piece lose the king it's game over so i'm not going to give any value because our king is the most important piece. so let's start with the opening guidelines so we know that what are minor pieces these three are the minor pieces that is the pawn knight and bishop and the rook and the queen are major pieces okay so in the first guideline would be you need to remove develop means remove them out develop you know get them slowly out get develop the minor pieces like i mentioned in the minor pieces is the pawns the knight and the bishop not the rook and the queen so we save our rook the major pieces we save them for the better the other half of the game the middle game and the end game because we don't want to lose them in the opening that is the reason because in the opening we attack by other pieces so we do not get them out early in the game we start with the minor pieces in the opening so in the opening we try to remove our knights and our bishops okay so in order to remove the bishop we have to start with the soldiers which are in the center for example something like e4 that's why if you see if you go and check the top players the masters and the world champions they generally start with e4 or d4 okay they do not start with um, h4 or something so do for fun or you know just to um that is their creativeness and it is not bad i'm not saying it is bad but this is when we start playing chess if we follow like a certain guidelines and you know something it's just like if we are cooking okay we we have a recipe right we if we are, if we are just learning to cook we will follow a certain kind of recipe but once we are you know kind of like an expert in it we can start experimenting with different plans and ideas different um it just your own uh, creative ideas the same way in chess also at the start we follow some kind of guidelines but as you go as you gain more experience you can experiment with your own ideas which is a good thing but at the start imagine you you start cooking and you start with 
experiment at the first dish that you cook. You can you can uh, imagine what the, the disaster that will turn out, right? It's going to be a mess. So the same way in chess also, if you start with your own ideas at this, uh, when you are just starting a career, when you just start learning to play chess, it's going to be a mess. So that's the reason when we start, we have to follow a few guidelines which will take us to the right path. And then later on, you can start your own creative ideas. Okay. So like I said, we have to remove our mind pieces. That is the bishops and the knights. And in order to remove these bishops, you have to start with your center points. Either you start with e4 opening or you can start with the d4. That is up to you. This one or the king's pawn. I, I start with my queen's pawn because I like it's uh, I like the opening that I get from d4 onwards. Okay, so if you uh, start with e4, your the the reason to start with the center pawn is these are the center points. If you see, this is the center point of a chessboard. Because this is the center point where you can see my mouse, my cursor right now here. This is the center point and the squares uh, adjacent to it. These four squares are called the center squares. It's also called the heart of the chessboard. So these squares is E4, E4, alphabet E, number four, D4, alphabet D, number four, E5, and D5. So this these four are the center squares. So we have to try to get our pawns to these center squares because it's also called the heart of the chessboard. It's the most important part of a chessboard. If we have a lot of control on these center squares, then we have a lot of control on the board. And in chess, you need control of the game. If you have control on the game, you have control on your open side as well. So that's the reason these four squares is the most important part of the chessboard. So we have to try to push our pawns towards the center okay and pushing the pawn over here it control of this square right or if you play d4 it gives you control on e5 and it also does the other other thing that is to remove the bishops out so it opens one we are doing two things when we push the pawns to the center we are controlling the center as well as we are opening up the diagonal for our bishop so we can get the bishop out later on right so that is the reason starting the center ones gives you uh, its best options that you have at the start of the game. Okay, so develop the minor pieces that is the bishops and the knights and the center pawns. And then the second uh, principle, the second guideline states that control the center square, which I just said, the center square, which is the heart of the chessboard. This is the second uh, guideline. So you have to try to get control of these four squares. So playing something like e4 or d4 will give you two advantages. One is opening up your bishops as well as getting gaining control of the center space. Okay, then um, going forward, castle the king and keep it safe. So let's just I'm gonna play some moves. White has started with controlling the center. Black would do the same thing. Black would also want to control the center. We, we generally have to um, think the best moves that our opponent will also do. If we think that he's going to do something weak or start with the side pawns, anyway, we're going to get a good position. But we, whenever we prepare or we want to train in it, you have to train for the best option. So you're ready for, you know, whatever best that you're open. Even if you're very strong, you're still ready at the board. So if they start with something like d5, you can start with your knight because we have to remove the minor pieces, right? Okay. And once you remove your knight, you can remove your bishop out. And so you are you're done with one minor piece, two minor pieces, the knight and the bishop. You're still left with this bishop and the knight. So same way, you can start with something like e3 so that you open up this bishop. Because if we go to e4, what's going to happen? This soldier will capture us, right? So he cannot do it. He can't go with e4. He can go with something like e3 and then remove this bishop out. Okay. Remove the other minor piece out. Done with the minor pieces, or even if you want to do the castle before that, it's also a good thing because castling your king. I think you'll have heard in palaces there is always a place called a castle where the king is. So in chess, we have something called as a castle, and where we keep our king safe. It is we do a castle so that our king remains safe in the game. We don't want our king in danger. See. You can follow a simple uh, technique. 
keep your king safe attack your opponent's king so to keep your king safe you have to do something which is called a castle and to do a castle you first need to clear the path you need to remove the pieces that are between the king and the rook the castle involves the king and your rook so to do the castle you have to remove your bishops and knights which you anyway have to do because in an opening you have to remove your minor pieces first okay so once you've done this um you can go for your castle so the castle is the king in only this is like a special move you have, you can do a castle in the game only once so only in a castle the king can jump otherwise it can never jump it goes one step i have already shown you how the king moves right it just goes one step at a time it can go forward downwards right left and diagonally but just one step so when we do a castle our king can take two steps one two and the rook goes over it so this is like kind of like a magical move it's a special move that we have it is we cannot do a castle more than once it's once you have done it we cannot uh, do it again and one more rule is that we cannot do a castle if we have moved our king already say something happened like you know we have moved the king for some reason the king now you cannot do a castle you cannot do a castle now because we have already moved our king so if you have moved your king once in the chess game after that you cannot do a castle so like even the same thing with the soldiers right if you move them once you cannot jump again or if you jump to them once after that you cannot jump again same way with castle you can do it only once in the chess game and it is done to keep our king safe see the rules say that castle the king and keep it safe so as you can see there are three soldiers guarding the king right he, this is the king is safe in this castle right now so keep it safe means what now our open and also my castle keep it safe means that we do not push these soldiers we do not open up our king if our king gets exposed say the soldier uh, somehow moves from here and it comes out from it gets captured or something and then there is no soldier on g2 our king is going to be exposed right so you need to make sure that you do not push these uh, soldiers too far you can go maximum say one step like h3 or something but moving your soldiers towards you know so like two head on opening up our king would just be you know the knight can also come here and jump and take capture this one so we should make sure that once we have castle our king is safe where it is so after we castle do not push these three pawns that we have keep it safe but you can't push once like you know one step ahead but not more than that okay so these are just some guidelines and then we have one more guideline which says gain more space so as you know chess is a game between two two armies okay or you could say two teams where if you if you make half of the chess board if you divide the board into two you could get these as Okay, so get the board into two from here. We just keep the red side as white territory. Okay, and the other side is blue territory. So I've just highlighted the the white side is red color, and the other side is black territory. Okay, there's no other color that I can keep, so I can't. So anyway, so. This is white territory, and the other half is black territory. I have not highlighted black side. So, if our soldiers or any of our pieces enter inside after the fourth rank, okay, this is number four. If we enter inside five, it means we have entered our open in territory, right? As we increase the squares, we have gained more territory. So here, uh, white has more territory, and we have more space. so this is what it means by gaining more space if you increase your territory on the chess board you can gain more space and if you gain more space you have more mobility for your pieces to move right so your pieces have more space to move and you have more ideas you can think of so that is the meaning of gaining more space like i will just give you an example let me just play a game and it's very easy to identify who has more space like for example here in this position 
white steam has more space because we have already entered inside black sterility, right? So this is all white side sterility. And we have already got our the soldiers inside black sterility. Okay, so this is the example of gain more space. So if you remove your minor pieces and if you control, if you not going back to it, if you your minor pieces, that is your bishops, knights, you control the center squares, you castle your king, okay, you do all that and you gain more space. All openings are really created. See, openings is not something um, which is, um, you know, that you can just play it on the chessboard. It is created by, by grandmasters or by very famous players. They have started these openings, but they have started these openings based on these um, basic principles that we have, the basic guidelines. Based on these, the openings are created. So if you just do these, you should get a decent position till your middle game. So remove your knights, your bishops, and generally I would suggest to first start okay with the center pawn, whichever one, king's pawn or the queen's pawn, and then go with your knight first because uh, we. I generally follow a pattern where knight, bishop, knight, bishop. Like first I would remove my knight, then my bishop, then I would remove the other pawn so that I can open up the bishop, then another knight, and then the bishop because. When we uh, open up, with, we start with knights because knights have less number of squares than the bishop, right? The bishop has more number of squares. So you are so which square to place it would be the best. So you should keep that option open where your opponent would have to think, okay, can my, can my opponent can move a bishop to all these squares. So, you know, they get a bit confused. So if you move your knight, anyway, you cannot move. If you move knight towards the side, you do not control the center squares. Right, that's the reason we take our knights towards the center so that we can control these four center squares, right? So generally our opponent can predict that we're going to get the knight here, but they do not know if we want to place the bishop here or here. So we can we can just you know keep that suspense for a little one move more, like each move. This is called one move, and then this would be the second move. So we can just delay that a little bit so that we can confuse our opponent. So First, you could go with your knight, then your bishop, then your other knight, then open up the other bishop. Because you have many squares just to, like, you know, keep our options open and choose the best. We can delay the bishop. So first, go with knights and then bishop. That is up to you, which, which one you're comfortable with. More. But it generally, the pattern is knights, then bishop, okay? So, uh, like I said, we remove our knights also towards the center. The same way how we push our soldiers towards the center to control the center squares, even our knights are placed towards the, we move them in such a way that we control, see, we get the knight here, we are controlling. What does control mean? For example, if I, even if I start with my knight, it's a good move. Any piece that comes here, I can capture it, right? So your knight has control on these two center squares when it starts from F3. But if you start from something like on the side, you do not get much control of the center squares. That is the reason. Uh, remove your knights, develop your knights towards the center space. So this is some basic opening principles and um, these four principles, these four guidelines, I would say not principles, not rules, because you have an option. It's not like if you don't do it, you're going to lose the game. I'm not saying that. But if you do it, you will get at least a decent position till your middle game. So if you have no idea how the opening is played, how to reach till the middle game, then if you follow these steps and you play many games in this, you might lose some because you might give your pieces, but this will give you at least a decent position till your middle game. Now, one more thing that I wanted to um, clear with you all is these, these values that we give, right? Why, why are we given these values? Because we know that these pieces, like for example, the pawn is worth only one and the rook is worth five. So if suppose there is a pawn at eight, six, I wouldn't give my bishop, which is worth three, for the pawn, which is one. Like if I go and capture it, I know that the rook can come and capture me. So I am going to lose three points 
see generally we see oh we can capture that piece but you should know that your bishop is worth much more than this pawn this what this pawn is just worth the soldier is just worth one point and your bishop is worth three points so if you take this pawn you're going to get one yeah you can be happy that you have one one point but the sad part is you're going to lose three points so that is if you if you calculate the full thing you're just going to lose points and the more points that you lose the more pieces that you lose the less the more weak your army is going to get because you are losing your strong pieces right you're losing them one by one so material material means that your pieces the material value like you should make sure that you have at least an equal value of pieces that you're opening or something more if you have less than them then it is a simple word your 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 team is weaker because you do not have that many forces as your opponent has. Like for example, right now we lost our bishop for this one one. So our opponent has an extra bishop. So he has a bishop which is worth three points, and we for that we have got one extra. So it does it does not it doesn't make sense to give a piece which is a worth of a higher value and lose it for a piece which is worth of a smaller value. So this is just simple logical thinking. Okay, but it it will come with practice unless. Well, even first, I used to get excited. Okay, I'm getting a pawn. But the thing is, if you see that once you see your opponent captured you, then you feel bad. So if you think before that, okay, if I take this, which piece can capture me? I know that the knight can jump. I know that it can go straight and capture, and I have a pawn which can capture. Three pieces can capture me. So I shouldn't go there. It's danger. So this way we reason out and decide if the move we're thinking is a good move or a bad one. But suppose say the pawn was on g5. Now if we capture it, there is no danger. See, capturing pieces and gaining material is a good thing, but we should make sure that in that process, we don't lose our own pieces which are of a higher value. For example, here, if I capture this one, there is no danger. There is nothing that can capture me, right? The knight cannot come, it cannot jump straight, it can jump L. This one cannot jump. If it was here, it could capture me diagonally. So here we can capture the piece. So you should be alert where you can take the piece. It's like you uh, take the piece and you run. You, I mean, you shouldn't. You shouldn't get caught when you go and you take that piece. Okay, so uh, it's something like kabaddi, right? When you you enter in the your open inside the the other piece side, you you may you need to make sure that you don't get caught in that. Otherwise, you you're going to lose one person. In your piece. same way in chess, you need to make sure that your piece does not get. It, okay, we can give we can give the piece like for example the bishop. We can give it for a knight because we know the value of the bishop is. And the value of the knight is also three. So giving three for three is a good thing. It's it's not a bad decision. It's a good decision. So it's not a great decision, but it is just a normal decision because the value of the bishop is three and the value of the knight is also three. So it is fair enough. But if you are giving your bishop for another piece, or say let's just say the queen. Okay, let's start with something like this, and say we take this pawn with the queen. We know that this knight can come and jump and capture our queen, right? So we are going to give nine to capture one. So that completely doesn't make sense, right? We're taking one soldier. You might say, okay, I'm getting that soldier. But the thing is, if we look, if we look a little bit further, we are going to lose our queen. So this is where we need to calculate a little bit. But in the same point, you could have taken it with the knight. Even if the knight takes you, you have lost three, but you have also gained three. So it is a fair deal. Okay, so this is just some basic concepts of chess that, you know, I think some of you must be knowing it already, but those of you who do not know, and, you know, this is, I think, the opening part, if you play this much, it, you get a decent position. And not just that, there are many, many uh, websites to play. And in chess also, I just wanted to show you all, in a real tournament, we have something called as a chess block. Okay, it's generally we have right now is what is called a digital chess block, which looks like this. Okay, these are your digital chess blocks because they are um, digital. And then you also have the Russian chess blocks, which were used much before. When I started playing chess, we had the Russian chess block. So it was more like, you know, they are not very accurate because they are, you know, like a clock and we cannot determine the number of seconds very clearly. It's very difficult to play and see, you know, exactly where you're going to lose on time. But in in a digital chess clock, we can see exactly this is the number of minutes left and this is the number of seconds that we have. 
step. So a digital chess club is something more enhanced and it is a better thing that is being used for right now. And even if you all want to train, there are there is different chess websites where you all can play chess games against different players all over the world. I generally use, there are many websites. I use uh, chess.com. It's the most uh, used website where you can play against each other. You can you have time limits here. So playing chess, and even if you lose, it's fine. I mean, we learn from the game. Even if we lose a match, you're going to learn where you went wrong. And even if you win, you don't need to get too excited because some players are kind of weak, some are strong. So, you know, you just have fun with it and you can learn even if you lose it. All right. So, um, uh, yes, Ivana. Yes, ma'am. I'm done with the. Okay. Thank you, Ivana, for the beautiful session. I'm sure all participants got the very good foundation for chess. Now, there are two questions, Ivana, uh, like they're posted privately. Uh, Nasik Mohamad is asking. Is castle one move? Is castle one move? Yes, it's it is one move. Um, now to do a castle, what Rajik put it? I say you have to remove your minor pieces. So once you're done with that, okay, in one move, I'll just show you how it is. The king takes two steps, the rook goes over it. So in one move, you do a castle. So <coughs> one move, it's, it's not going to take you. Okay, one move, king will go here. Then the next move, your opening makes. Then it goes in there. It is it is one move, both the pieces. So it's a special move. Any more questions, anyone? Yeah, uh, there is one more from Kishore S. What about special rules in chess? OK, so there are some special rules which I haven't uh, covered up in this session because that there are more special moves. Like, for example, the pawns, when they reach, like, you know, that the pawns start from the second we start from here, but if this pawn reaches, it keeps going forward and it keeps going on and on, and it makes its way till the eighth rank, eighth row. Here, this is the eighth rank. We call these ranks. As we go horizontally, we call them ranks. So, first rank, second rank, third rank, fourth rank, fifth rank, sixth rank, seventh, eighth rank, and as we go um, vertically upwards. We call them files. So this is called A file, B file, C file, D file, E file, F file, G file, H file. Okay, so if our soldier reaches, let's just say this soldier of ours, let me clear off. See, for it to reach the eighth rank, it has to be clear, right? The squares have to be clear. So once it reaches the eighth rank, what's going to happen is it keeps moving forward. Once you reach there, you get promoted. You get an option to promote into a queen, a rook, a bishop, or a knight. Any piece that you want, except the king. You can promote to any piece that you want. I would suggest the queen because the queen is the strongest piece, right? So you can promote into a queen. This, uh, it's just like a promotion because the soldier has reached from, from where it was. It has, you know, traveled and reached here. It, it is like kind of like a reward to it. And it's a promotion that it gets to a different piece. Understood? So this is one special move. Then we have something called the Enfacent. And then we have something as the side castle. So those are, you know, if you go to the details of it, then you need to know more about it. Like, for example, if you want to do a queen side castle, we have seen castle on the king side. But if you want to do a castle on the queen side, this is called the king side because the queen is starting from here and this is called the king side. So if you want to do a castle on the queen side, you need to remove your pieces which are in the path in 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 between the rook and the king. So you will have to remove, say, the knight and the bishop, then the queen as well, so that the path is clear. And after that, king takes two steps and the rook jumps over it. So this is called your queen side castle. So one, two and the rook goes over it. So this is another special move. So we have castle as a special move. We have queen side castle as a special move. We have pawn promotion into a different piece as a special move. And we have something called n percent as a special move. I will not explain that, but I will just 
show you in general what does n percent mean um let's just say your opponent's pawn reaches the fourth rank that is inside the white territory and you take two steps with your pawn it can so this is again a special move so this is a very uh, not a very easy thing but with time when you see whenever your opponent reaches inside your territory that is the fourth rank the opponent soldier reaches only the soldiers can do n percent it's called n percent so whenever it is inside your territory okay the fourth rank so black soldier has reached the fourth rank, and your soldier has to take two steps if it takes one step you can just capture it right it has to take two steps then it can cut it in between this is only only for n percent you can do this and the same way even if white soldier reaches inside black territory and your soldier takes two steps one two then i can cut it in between so this is called n percent okay questions that was a good question now uh, i think it was on nasik right ma'am uh, ivana there are a few more questions um, okay. sanjay is asking which team should make the first move okay so in chess i know it is kind of biased i in favor of this decision but white always starts the game first i don't know why it is created that way but white starts first and then black starts i mean it should have been given like turns but yeah after that both has given equal number of chances but at the start of the game white always starts the game first okay okay Okay, Velro is as asking: Is there any minimum number of moves to offer a draw to your opponent? That you need. Eric. Then, okay. So, uh, no, there is no minimum number of like you need to make ten moves then offer a draw. No, but in some fide rating tournaments, they do have that you cannot agree for a draw until the twenty. First twenty-five moves, but if you do threefold repetitions, threefold repetition means like suppose I've got the same position, I've got the same moves. Both of us have done the same moves for three times, and we that is called repetition moves. So then you can that is like kind of like both of us all have mutually agreed and taken a draw. But if the rule is there some tournaments do have that rule at first 25 moves you cannot draw or you cannot take the draw but they have been told well in advance that you cannot do that so those tournaments they do like this three fold repetition but generally speaking there is no rules like that but there is a rule that you cannot offer your opponent draw too many number of times you cannot think to say i offer you a draw and you do that for say four five times you can actually claim and call the arbiter the arbiter is like a referee who comes and decides you know um, what is right or wrong or he knows all the rules of fide and stuff so if you have if you are doing something like that like you know you you keep disturbing your opponent disturbing right and so every move to offer a draw so that time you can claim that your opponent has is doing this he will get a warning and if he continues to do this then like i showed you the clock that we have the digital clock or the um rush so they deduct your time or you know they give you another strict warning or they do they give you a small penalty for that Okay. Yeah. The next question is from Mark. Can you mm -hmm. promote two pawns to two queens or more? Yes, you can. Suppose you have taken uh, one of your pawns to your. I mean, one pawn has promoted into a queen. Then even this one can go and promote into a queen. But you should have your path clear. I mean, there should not be anything to capture you. But if you successfully reach the eighth rank, then you can promote to another queen as many as you want. That is. See, it's your reward, right? You progress that much, you will get your reward. As many times as you progress, is that many times you will get your reward. That is, that cannot be taken. And the queen that you get, if it is played, if you're playing an online game, automatically when you promote, they will give you an option for which piece you want to promote, and you can do that. And if you're playing in a real chess tournament, you need to again call the arbiter, ask for an extra queen, and then you can play it on the chess board. So they will keep giving you queens if you keep promoting to an, another queen. Okay. The next question, what we have is, uh, Kishore is asking, if B two pawn reaches B eight, can we replace the pawn with the queen? If B two pawn reaches B eight, B eight, yeah. So if this pawn 
to manages to reach to b8 you can replace it with a queen right that is your question it's oh, yes that was a question yeah yeah, yeah correct, correct. You can, next hmm? yeah can continue continue no that that is the answer like once it reaches the eighth rank you can talk to queen is the same thing what um the previous question was the same answer to that okay how many seconds are there to make a move okay so that is a very uh, nice question because in chess there are uh, different times i mean if you play in a real chess tournament or if you play under fide chess tournament you might have to play a 1 hour 30 minutes um, chess game so you will have 1 hour 30 minutes your opponent will have 1 hour 30 minutes plus there will be an increment of 60 seconds per move and once you reach the 40th move they will give you extra 40 minutes so in a standard tournament but if you are playing online in any blitz tournament or rapid tournament you can decide your time i sometimes I, you can even play a chess game of 1 minute i play a lot of 1 minute those are called blitz chess games i play a lot of them it's on chess.com you can just go and like like i said right you can there is where there are different platforms to play like for example i want to play a game okay i just need to i need to uh, enter in first Not so you can you can decide. Let's just see live. See, there are different players play, and they have different timings. You can start with one minute, or you can go to ten minutes, five minutes. But one minute is fun. But if you want to go into you know professional chess, or if you want to focus on the game, then like later on you will have different timings. But For a good chess player, any any chess player who has been playing for a long time, they can play from one minute chess to even two hours of chess play each each side. So generally, if you see in a standard tournament, a chess game can go for about five to six hours as well. Okay. Um, okay. There are two more questions. After you have castled, can you move your king? After you after you cast, yes, can you, you move your king? Yes, you can. You, that's a good question. Once you can, you can move your king again. It is not like, but if you have moved your king once, you cannot castle. And also, you cannot castle. Now, I have not explained to you what is check because we won't be able to cover up everything here. So, whenever something attacks your king, right, it is called a check. So now, right now, the bishop is attacking the king, so the king is in check. So when your king is in check again, you cannot castle. You can only move it. but if it's not in check you can castle anyway but if it is in check your king is in danger either you move your king or you block it you block the check with something else so i would suggest whenever they give you a check right try to block it because if you move your king what's going to happen you won't be able to castle later on and once you have castle yes you can move your king there is nothing like that you can move it there is but you cannot castle again or you cannot uncastle Many players think that they can do, like you know, undo the castle. You can't do that. Okay. There's one more question. I think you answered already. Can we castle after a check? Uh, no. After a check, you can, but if you haven't moved your king, if you have moved your king, you cannot castle now. But if you have blocked the check with another piece, say the bishop move, now you can castle. So. You should make sure that when you are in check, you do not move your king. If you move your king, what's going to happen? Then you cannot do a castle later. But suppose, say, you do not have any pawn over here, or you could block it even with your knight. Because even if the bishop captures, like I said, the bishop's value is three, and your knight value is, six, you can take it back, right? So you can block it in this way or this way, or with the bishop as well. But do not block it with the queen. What's going to happen? The bishop will take the value worth nine, and we are taking three. Not a good deal, right? So here we cannot castle when it is in check. You cannot castle, but if you block it with another piece, then you can castle. But if you have moved your king after the check, say this is the situation. Now you cannot castle the king because you have already moved your king once. Okay. Should we always mention if it is a check? Uh, yes. I mean, not now. Like when we start playing, we are told when you say when you do a check, you say check. Okay, but uh, as you go into tournaments and not not all the players say it. I mean, it's not a rule that if you do if you don't say it, you're going to you know hit a penalty or anything. It's not nothing like that. We have been told that we need to say it, but 
it is like if you see it it's good if you don't see it what's going to happen is your open and want the want so if now see okay see you have checked your open and can they make a move like something like h they push something else it is illegal right because your king was in danger and you pushed something else so it will be called illegal one you make three illegals in a chess game you lose the game so sometimes people don't warn you because they want you to make the illegal because as soon as you make the illegal they call the arbiter and you have been given like one warning you have been given three warnings because you have not seen your king in danger and not moved it so that would be if you make three of them you lose the game so sometimes people don't see it but yeah you can't see it or you don't see it. that's up to you that is your decision the last question what we'll take is is a castle only for a king yes a castle is only for the king because the, it's like the king we want to keep our king safe the other pieces some pieces are kept behind so that we can defend the king but most of our pieces go as an army to attack our opponents and we take them together we don't just like i would not just take my queen right inside my opponent's army i would take like a team of them to attack our opponent's king so we cannot you know keep all our pieces in a defensive mode our king is kept safe but we take all our other pieces to attack or we keep some pieces to defend and guard our king and we take the other uh, piece first to attack our opponent's king that is how chess is generally played. but there are different styles of playing there are different techniques of playing so this is the general approach how we move up our pieces yes that's it ivana thank you so much for clarifying all the queries thank you. a participant participants kind of know the feedback link is posted in the chat box kindly fill the form the recorded session of the webinar will be available in our youtube channel st joseph engineering college within a week as we have come to the end of this webinar i now request ms vanisha rodriguez assistant physical education director to propose the vote of thanks good afternoon everyone first of all i would like to thank ivana for the wonderful session on basic concepts of chess on behalf thank of the entire sjc family i thank you ivana for accepting our invitation and for sharing your knowledge thank you ivana thank you ma'am it was it was a pleasure to meet anything for our college thank you i sincerely thank the management of sjc for giving us the opportunity to organize this webinar i wholeheartedly thank mr rajesh raju mr alistair disuza ms jacinta and the press and media cell for all their help and support and special thanks to ms rachana krasta sports advisor of sjc for rendering the helping hand and supporting me in organizing this webinar thank you rachana ma'am a big thank you to all the attendees for active participation and patient listening thank you one and all thank you ma'am a big thank you to you two for organizing this webinar participants once again i'll tell you kindly fill in the feedback form the certificate will be sent to you within 3 working days so we'll wind up this webinar thank you all Stay safe stay healthy have a good day